Hello, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's lecture by Dr. Fitzroy Morrissey. Dr. Morrissey is a fellow of All Souls College in Oxford. He received his BA, MPhil, and DPhil degrees in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Oxford. His main research interests are in Islamic intellectual history, medieval and modern, with an emphasis on the analysis of thought in Islamic mysticism, philosophy, political theory, and interreligious relations. He has published widely in these areas, and he is presently, among other projects, working on a book on modern Islamic thought which will include South Asia, which is relevant, of course, to his subject of the lecture today, an Islamic philosophy of plurality, Shah Waliullah of Delhi, 1703 to 1762, on the unity and diversity of humanity. And I shall hand it over to him now and we are waiting to hear the lecture. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ron, for that very kind introduction. And thanks, uh, Thea, for the invitation to speak to the Oxford Interfaith Forum, which uh, is a great honor and privilege um, to be invited. And I'm, I'm really glad that uh, Ron Ettler is uh, chairing the panel. Uh, he and I have worked uh, together for for many years um, and he uh, guided me through my uh, all my studies so so it's a great honor to to be um to have him introducing me so today i'm going to talk about uh, shah waliullah uh, of delhi as ron said um and shah waliullah um is perhaps one of the most influential and interesting of modern islamic thinkers and has a lot to say on themes which I think uh, should be of interest to uh, followers of the Oxford Interfaith Forum. So let me just see this PowerPoint's working. Great. So, um, so I thought over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, um, I would uh, divide my talk into four parts. So first, I'll just give a brief overview of uh, who Shah Waliullah was and the kind of main outlines of his thought, his life and work, what his intellectual project was. And then the heart of the lecture will be uh, concerned with his thinking on uh, what's known in Arabic as fitra, the natural disp disposition of mankind, and how this relates to his thinking on the unity and diversity of humanity. And then finally, uh, we'll look at how this relates to questions of religious plural plurality. So uh, who was Shah Waliullah? Um, so he lived in the 18th century. Um, this uh, is a period of uh, political turmoil for uh, the Mughal Empire. So he was born in, in Delhi in 1703. Um, he lived through the reigns of no fewer than uh, 11 different Mughal emperors. And this is really uh, regarded as a period of decline for, for the Mughal Empire. Uh, his father, uh, Shah Abdul Rahim, was himself a renowned scholar and Sufi mystic, uh, an adherent of the Naqshbandi Sufi order, which is a very uh, one of the most important Sufi orders, not only in South Asia, but also in the whole uh, Central Asian uh, Persianate regions, and specifically it was an adherent of the Mujaddidi branch of the Naqshbandi order. And this is an extremely influential um, Sufi movement. It's called the Mujaddidi order after uh, a fi its founding figure, Ahmed Zir Hindi, who died in 1624, who was also an, an Indian uh, Muslim thinker, and who his followers uh, regard as the mujaddid, the renewer of Islam for the second Islamic millennium. So this is a, essentially a reformist Sufi movement which seeks to harmonize uh, mystical Islam with a sh shari, 
legal-minded uh, Islam. Shah Wali Allah's father, uh, Shah Abdul Rahim, founded uh, a madrasa or uh, Islamic seminary uh, near Delhi called Al Madrasa Al Rahimiya. And this is where Shah Wali Allah himself was educated. This was a very important uh, Islamic school. It was known particularly for its emphasis on the study of hadith, the sayings uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, and also the rational sciences. So instead of the study only of jurisprudence, uh, the curriculum uh, really incorporated the direct study of hadith and uh, the rational sciences. Uh, so Shah Wali Allah, um, his father died when he was still in his teens, and uh, he, Shah Wali Allah was, uh, was, was chosen by his father as his successor, as the head of this madrasa. Um, where he, he would taught, teach for uh, several years of his life. In uh, a, a key moment in, in Shah Wali Allah's uh, intellectual trajectory uh, is uh, the years 1731 to two, for about 14 months, he went to the Hejaz, uh, Western region of Arabia, where uh, the uh, holy cities of Mecca and Medina located. He went on the, on the Hajj, on the pilgrimage. And there, while in, uh, in the holy cities, he joined uh, a circle or, or, or group of circles of Hadith scholars. And this was uh, a period in which the return to Hadith, uh, the direct study of Hadith, was uh, a very central part of Islamic reformist thinking. And Shah Wali Allah beca became part of these circles. While in uh, Mecca, Medina, he also um, underwent a number of mystical experiences. And I should say that, that his father had initiated him into the Naqshbandi Sufi order as well. So he was a Sufi from a young age. And he records in, in um, his account of these mystical experiences, he, he recalls 47 such uh, mystical visions that he underwent uh, while in the Hejaz. And the, among the content of the, these visions, he seems to have um, felt that he'd been elected uh, as a reformer, as someone uh, who would reform Islam in a period um, of political crisis and uh, decline. And he, he, he says in one of his works that the greatest divine gift that was bestowed on me is that I was vest, invested with the robes of opening a new age and the success of subsequent ages was placed in my hands. Shah Wali Allah was a prolific author. He uh, wrote almost 50 works on a wide range of topics in the various uh, Islamic sciences. A number of his early works um, focused on, on mystical themes, on Sufi ideas. He is noted for his Persian translation of the Quran, and he also uh, wrote on jurisprudence, uh, on the study of Islamic law. His um, probably most important and influential work, and the one that I'm going to be talking about this evening, is uh, called in Arabic Hujat Allah al-Baliga or God's conclusive argument and I'll, I'll say a bit more in a, in a moment about what this work entails. Shah Wali Allah was an extremely influential figure in the subcontinent almost all reformist Islamic movements which emerged in the 19th and 20th centuries trace their legacy back to him. So I've, I've listed some of the most prominent ones there. Um, the Tariqah, the Muhammadiyah. This was a, a very important movement which Shah Wali Allah's grandson uh, was involved in uh, and uh, was essentially a reformist movement which uh, sought to purify um, Islam of what uh, the, its members saw as, as certain excesses. The Ahl al-Hadith, was a movement which sought to ground Islamic thinking on the Hadith uh, in particular. The Obandi movement, very important madrasa uh, 
in North India, another reformist movement, the Barelwis, their um, Sufi-inspired reformists, but also the modernists uh, such as Shah, um, such as uh, Said Ahmed Khan at Aligarh, and uh, the Islamists of the Jamaat Islami in the 20th century. So this is really, his, his influence spans the whole spectrum of modern Islamic movements in India from Sufi mystical uh, oriented movements to more puritanical movements to modernists, liberal modernists to uh, political Islamists. In a sense, this is, this is partly uh, a consequence of, of the great richness of his thought that, that thinkers can, can find what they want to find uh, in, his, in his work. Muhammad Iqbal, who um, is a great uh, poet, philosopher, and uh, often regarded as a kind of patron saint of, of Pakistan, uh, in his great series of lectures, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought, in Islam, he said that uh, Shah Walilullah was perhaps the first Muslim who felt the urge of a new spirit in him. And he's, he's often regarded as a, a pi one of the key Islamic revivalists of the 18th century. So what did this project, what did this revivalist project, if, if we want to call it that, entail? So as I've said, indicated already, um, Shah Waliullah felt as if he was living in a period of decline, not only in his native India, but within the wider Muslim world. In Hujjah al-Allah in the, in the preface to this work, he says that he was frustrated by the fact that I am in an era of ignorance, jahl in Arabic, partisanship, asabiyya, and following the passions, ittiba al-hawa, in which every person admires his own ruinous opinions, and simply being the contemporary of someone is the basis of disagreement. And this issue of, of disagreement is one that uh, really is central to Shah Waliullah's thought. As I um, have put down on the, on the last point there, he was someone who sought to reconcile uh, conflicting tendencies. He was, he was very much concerned with um, partisanship, what he regarded as fanaticism for particular denominations, legal schools, theological groups, Sufi movements, and really sought to find uh, a means of reconciling these various trends within contemporary and historical Islam. So he, con he contrasted this situation of what he regarded as decline with what he called the happy centuries, al-Qurun al-Maqbula, of the earliest period of Islamic, Islamic history the period of the Salaf, the pious predecessors, who were more in tune, as he saw it, with the original spirit of Islam. So because of this situation of decline, he thought there was a need for renewal, uh, tajdeed, this is the same concept which is central to the Mujaddidi uh, Naqshbandi tradition and to much uh, Islamic reformist thought more generally. So he said there's a need for renewal at the hands of someone who had been enabled by God to understand this concept of God enabling the reformer to understand the truth of religion is very much central to his thinking. And he regarded himself as one of these special individuals who'd been singled out by God. So he said, he says that God has enabled me to understand, um, among other things, the source of the ways to happiness are the four qualities which, yeah, and I'll say something about what, what this means later. So there's this need for renewal. How is this renewal to come about? Now, like many reformers, uh, one of Shah Waliullah's slogans is the need for a return to the Quran and Hadith to the fundamental sources of Islam. And we've seen already that this was something which was um, central to his father's thinking and also which uh, was part of the, the reformist uh, spirit which he picked up while in the Hijaz. He says uh, in Hujjat Allah Baliga, know that the only way to knowledge of the divine laws and commandments is through the reports, the khabar, this is the hadith of the prophet. So we need to return to 
study the hadith of the prophet this should be the basis for building our understanding of islam and he says that the prophet is the only um, infallible uh, interpreter of the law so we should look to him before anyone else in trying to understand what islam is now because shah wali allah has this principle of the return to quran and hadith as i've said he's often grouped together with other uh, revivalist thinkers of the 18th century, including figures such as uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, uh, the um, eponym of the, the Wahhabi movement, uh, which, uh, which, which dominates Islam in uh, Saudi Arabia today. Um, but while some of those other reformist or revivalist tendencies, such as Wahhabism uh, are often regarded as literalist and, and puritanical movements. Shah Wali Allah's return to Quran and Hadith was in a sense mediated by a desire to rationalize those fundamental sources and, underst and to understand what he called the inner meanings or the secrets, the asrar of Islamic legal and theological doctrines and ritual practices. And when he talks about understanding the, the secrets or the inner meanings of Islamic law and theology, um, in respect to Islamic law, what he really means is uh, to identify what uh, are known in Arabic as the masaleh, the things which are beneficial, the, the benefits um, of Islamic law. So his conception of uh, law is very much a one which is concerned with the function, uh, the purpose, the purposes behind the law, the rationale behind God's revelation of the Sharia. And his, he builds an ethics and a politics on this basis. So for him, the aim of uh, ethics is to enable what he, so he has this conception of, of man as being divided between an angelic and an animal or bestial side. And so the aim of, of ethics and politics is to enable the angelic side of man to overcome this bestial side and to enable reason to dominate man's lower passions. As I've said, uh, a key plank of his project was to reconcile conflicting tendencies. And so as examples, he seeks to reconcile the um, Sufi metaphysics associated with Ibn Arabi, who's a very uh, influential Sufi thinker uh, of the 13th century from Al-Andalus, who is associated with the idea of the unity of existence, that all of existence is a manifestation of the divine being. So on the one hand, you have this perspective. On the other hand, the perspective of Ahmed Sirhindi, the, uh, the founder of the Mujaddidi uh, Naqshbandi order, who spoke instead of uh, the unity of witnessing, the idea that actually the mystics, the mystic experience is a momentary vision of unity with God, but this doesn't uh, reflect actually uh, a, an objective reality of, of all pervasive unity. Shah Wali Allah says that these two perspectives are in fact in harmony with one another. He also seeks to reconcile uh, the four uh, schools of Islamic law, uh, of, of, Sunni, of Sunni law, and uh, he also seeks to reconcile the uh, perspectives of Sufism, philosophy, and legal thinking. So that's a very brief overview of uh, Shah Wali Allah's intellectual project. So now let's um, move on to the, the main topic of the talk, which is his thinking on the unity and diversity of humanity. And I've begun with this statement, which I think uh, reflects his what what what's quite a remarkable uh, degree of interest on his part in this issue. And he says there's no multiplicity that does not begin with unity. So, so central to his thinking on this uh, question of unity and diversity is the concept of man's fitra, man's natural disposition. Now, this is a Quranic concept. Quran, uh, chapter 30, verse 30, in the translation of Abdullah Yusuf Ali, 
says, and so set thy face steadfastly towards the one ever true faith, Adin Hanifan, turning away from all that is false in accordance with the natural disposition, Fitra, which God has instilled, Fatara, from the same root, into man. For not to allow any change to corrupt what God has thus created, this is the purpose of the one ever true faith, Adin Al Qayyim, but most people know it not. The concept of uh, that, that man has this natural disposition which God has instilled in him is also uh, connected by Islamic thinkers to Quran verse 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 172, which tells of uh, a primordial covenant which took place between uh, mankind and their creator before. Um, at, at the dawn of creation. So it says, when thy Lord drew forth from the children of Adam, from their loins, their descendants, and made them testify concerning themselves, saying, am I not your Lord who cherishes and sustains you? They said, yea, we do testify this, lest you should say on the day of judgment of this, we were never mindful. And alongside these Quranic verses, Muslim thinkers who've reflected on the meaning of fitra have cited uh, a hadith, saying of Muhammad, which says that every child is born in accordance with the natural disposition, fitra, but then their parents make them a Jew, a Christian, or a Magian, or a Zoroastrian. So what does this, this mean, this natural disposition? How has it been understood? And before Shah Walillah, um, almost every major Muslim thinker uh, had reflected uh, to some degree on, on the meaning of this concept of fitra. It's very central concept within Islamic thought. And I've cited just a few pertinent and, and influential ones here. So Ibn Hazm, who was an Andalusian jurist um, of the uh, literalist Zahiri school, he, uh, he says that fitra means Islam. So the natural man's natural disposition is to be a Muslim. And this is a very common position probably the, the most common interpretation. And so among the implications of this is that children of unbelievers, of, of non-Muslims who die in infancy will enter paradise, will be regarded uh, as Muslims. Ibn Sina or Avicenna, who is probably the most influential uh, Muslim philosopher, died in 1037. He has a slightly different perspective. He says that the fitra are the judgments that all humans share, regardless of their education or upbringing or their environment or context. And it's made up of what he calls first intelligibles, which are things which um, all people know um, to be true based on their intellect, such as that three is an odd number. And it's made up of judgments of estimation, wahmiyat, which are things which are known via um, the faculty of waham or estimation, which really are part of which is drawn from sense perception. He says that uh, fitra doesn't include moral principles, so, so moral judgments aren't known via this natural disposition because these are social conventions. He also says that uh, the fitra, the natural disposition, is not always accurate because um, it's based in part on judgments of sense perception, which the intellect mistakenly imagines to be things which are, which are um, certain truths. Al-Ghazali, who is an extremely important uh, Muslim theologian, Sufi, legal theorist, philosophical theologian, and an influence on Shah Wali Allah, he adopts this uh, view of Avicenna, uh, and he adds that uh, the fitra, the natural disposition of man, also contains knowledge of God's existence. And he says it doesn't contain moral principles. He's in alignment again with Avicenna, but that these moral principles come from revelation. So this is the role of Islam to, uh, to teach people moral judgments. And uh, if you want to know more about um, either the positions of Avicenna or Ghazali on this, uh, Frank Griffel. Uh, at Yale has written a very good article on this. And then you have Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, somewhat later in the 14th century, 
Ibn Taymiyyah, very influential Hanbali uh, thinker, who again is an influence on Shah Wali Allah. He says that fitra is Islam, so man's natural disposition is to be a Muslim, but that this is something which is potential, not necessarily actual. He says that man's natural disposition contains knowledge of God's existence. And unlike Ghazali and Avicenna, he says that it also includes moral principles, and he uses it also to argue for the existence of free will. So this, this background, um, this is background for, for our thinking about Shah Wali Allah's views. So Shah Wali Allah's um, conception of fitra can be divided into kind of four main themes. So first, that fitra is the predisposition to Islam. Second, that it, it contains a longing for ultimate felicity or salvation, some, some uh, form or another. Third, that uh, it contains a knowledge of moral judgments. So here he's in alignment with Ibn Taymiyyah against Al-Ghazali. And fourth, uh, that it is connected to social conventions which are shared by uh, different uh, peoples of different nations and communities. And this is linked to a key concept in his thought, which uh, he calls the irtifaqat, which is a neologism of his, which can be translated as the things which support civilization or, or development. So let's look at these in turn. And these, uh, these quotes are all taken from uh, God's conclusive argument. Um, so first, fitra is the predisposition to Islam. So uh, here, first, we have uh, a statement which, with which the, the whole book begins. He says, praise be to God who predisposed fatr and mankind to the religion of Islam and right guidance and fashioned them in the form of the pure, easy, magnanimous religion of primordial monotheism, al-millah al-hanifiyya. Al and this is if we look back at Quran 30, 30, uh, this is a reference to that Adin Hanifan, the one ever true faith or the primordial, the faith of primordial monotheism. He also, and this is the second quote, um, alludes to the idea of the primordial covenant that God made with the descendants of Adam. Uh, he says, when God created Adam as the father of humanity, so that the human race would begin with him, he originated in the world of images, the forms of his descendants, and represented their felicity and misery to them with light and darkness. He obligated them to follow his law and created in them knowledge of him and humble submission to him, which is the foundation of the covenant, al mithaq hidden in their natural disposition. So the idea is that within man's primordial nature, within his natural disposition, there is this knowledge of, uh, or th this inclination to uh, submit to God. This is part of the primordial covenant that God made with man. And we have another quote here. Um, I won't read it in full, but he says that there was created in man's uh, natural disposition or primordial nature, an inclination towards their creator. And further on, if you look further down, he says, whoever denies the divine will or does not affirm his right to worship, or denies the divine recompense, is an atheist who has lost the soundness of their natural disposition. So atheism is a, um, a contradiction of man's uh, fitra. He says that this is the severest form of human misery because it's, it's to be, in a sense, anti-human. So along with the predisposition to Islam, um, Fitra, in Shah Wali Allah's view, contains the longing for what he calls ultimate felicity or happiness. This is a Quranic term which is um, associated with the experience of, of paradise. And he says that know that spirits have a presence to which they are drawn like iron is drawn to a magnet. This presence is the presence of the holy, the place where souls which have been divested of their bodily garments join to the greater spirit. The explanation of this is that the individuals of the human species have determining properties which distinguish them one from another, as well as determining properties which they have in common, which is what the saying of the prophet, 
every child is born according to the natural disposition refers to. So here he refers to that hadith, which I mentioned earlier. The second quote uh, uses very similar language. He says, true felicity, true happiness, is the submission of one's animal side or bestial side to one's rational soul and the subjugation of the passions to reason. So this is the purpose of human existence, to submit one's animal side to one's angelic side and one's passions to one's reason. He says, the individuals of the human species, when their human form is sound and their substance is able to manifest the determining properties of the species in an abundant and complete way, long for this felicity and are drawn to it like iron to a magnet. That's that uh, simile again. This is a characteristic that God created for mankind and a natural disposition, fitra, that he disposed them for. How would it be possible for the Arabs and non-Arabs, despite their differences in their customs and religions and the distance of their places of habitation and countries from one another, to agree on a single thing, united as a species, unless this was due to the correspondence of their natural dispositions? How could it be otherwise? For you know that the angelic nature is found at the root of the natural disposition of man. So here we have a bit more detail on, on his understanding of Fitra. So Fitra, man's original nature is angelic. And so man has this natural inclination to return to this angelic nature through submitting their animal or base passions to reason and their angelic side. And Shah Wali Allah observes that this is a phenomenon which is discernible across different communities, both Arab and non-Arab. And this, this means essentially all, all of humanity, despite their different customs and religions. So, so man is, human beings are, are united on this longing for, uh, to return to their angelic nature. So third, fitra also in Shah Wali Allah's view includes moral judgments, the conception of moral principles. And Shah Wali Allah emphasizes um, four fundamental virtues, and these are purity, humility before God, magnanimity, and justice. For, the, for him, these are the four cardinal virtues. And he identifies these four virtues with the fitra. He says that state composed of these four fundamental virtues is called the natural disposition. He also says that the, um, so he talks about different ways in which God, um, that God must recompense people either with, with good or, or evil for the good and evil that they've done. And he says that there are two ways, or there are multiple ways in which this happens, but two of them, um, those which are linked to the nature of the human species and the role of the angels in this process, are a natural disposition which God predisposed mankind for. He also says you will not find any alteration in the natural disposition of God, but this only applies to the foundations and general principles of righteousness and sin, not to their ramifications and specific definitions. So the idea there is that human beings of different uh, backgrounds, upbringing, education, countries, religions, etc., agree on the general principles of what constitutes justice and, and, and righteousness and what's worthy of being rewarded and what's worthy of being punished by God, but uh, not necessarily on the specifics of how to put into practice those particular general principles. Finally, uh, he also links Fitra to social conventions. So um, he says in, in chapter 30 on the agreement of people on the irtifaqat, the, the supports of civilization, he says that no city among the inhabited regions, nor nation among those of moderate temperaments and virtuous morals, from the time of Adam to the day, the day of resurrection, is free of the supports of civilization, the Otifaqad. And their fundamental principles are accepted by everyone, century after century and generation after generation. They do not cease reproaching in the most severe way those who disobey them, nor regarding these things as self-evident matters due to their great renown. Do not be diverted, he continues, from what we have mentioned by the differences in the forms and specific ramifications of the supports of civilization. And here again, we see 
Shah Wali Allah's his interest in actually delving behind superficial diversity, whether of putting certain moral principles into practice or here um, social conventions, of delving deeper and looking at the kind of the fundamentals. And he says, for they agree, different nations agree, for example, on removing the stench of the dead and concealing their private parts, even though they may disagree on the form in which this is done. And they agree on making a marriage known and distinguishing it from fornication in the presence of witnesses, though they disagree on the forms. And they agree on the punishment of adulterers and thieves, though they differ in the forms. The sound natural disposition, fitra salima, decrees that people only agree on these things despite the difference in their temperaments and the distance of their countries from one another and the diversity of their sex and religions due to a correspondence in their natural dispositions which derives from the form of the species. So we've seen here and um, in the, the, uh, the, the other cases, in the case of moral principles and belonging for ultimate felicity, that fitra is in a sense, what explains why peoples of different nations, communities, and religions are united on certain issues, whether moral judgments or social conventions. So it explains the degree of unity of human nature that we see. However, the fitra can become corrupted. And he has a chapter on the veils uh, using Sufi language, preventing the manifestation of this natural disposition. He says there are three main veils. These are physical nature, which he identifies with man's lower soul, his, the, the seat of his base desires. The veil of convention, um, which he identifies with the lower world. And the veil of misunderstanding, which he says usually consists in liking the necessary being, likening God to his creatures or in associating other beings with God, so theological errors. So because the fitra uh, can be corrupted, there need to be solutions to this corruption. Chapter 35 deals with the way to remove these veils. And so he says that the way to remove the veil of physical nature is through spiritual exercises like fasting or staying up through the night in prayer, or um, from without by, by people reproaching and punishing those who follow their physical nature. He says that the veil of convention is lifted through remembering God, another Sufi concept, or through making acts of obedience to God, widespread conventions. And he says that the veil of misunderstanding is lifted through theological instruction and spiritual exercises. So in each of those three cases, there are ways which the individual themselves can undertake to, to remove these veils. And also there are ways which are imposed on them from, from outside. There's also, um, the corruption of the fitra also explains the need for religion. Uh, he says that in chapter 54, that people need an infallible guide, which, which is a prophet, and a religion led by uh, the prophet's successors, because although sound reason indicates how to make one's bestial side submit to one's angelic side, and you'll remember that that's, the, that's what ultimate felicity consists in, people nevertheless are ignorant of, this, um, of, of how to do this, because their intuitive perception has been corrupted by veils, such as the veils uh, listed in chapter 35. And this is like the condition of the person of choleric temperament. And this, this uh, simile here is quite typical of Shah Wali Allah. He often um, reaches for a medical metaphor. And so the idea, in a sense, is that a person of sound fitra is in a state of spiritual and intellectual health, while those whose fitra has been corrupted are um, unhealthy in, in their spiritual and intellectual nature. So we've seen that the... The, the solution to the corruption of the fitra is, is, is through religion, uh, among other things. And Shah Wali Allah also has a lot to say uh, in specific on the unity and diversity of religions. And this is the last um, part of my talk. And uh, he deals with this uh, topic uh, in a whole section. Uh, there, are, there are eight sections to the first part of the, 
God's conclusive argument, and a whole section is devoted to this question of, of religion and the unity and diversity of religions. And uh, particularly these, these early chapters of that section, chapter 56, the origin, it's titled The Origin of Religion is One, Though the Divine Laws and Codes are Many. And 57, the causes of the descent of divine re revelations to one age rather than another, and to one people rather than another. So let's look briefly at these. So chapter 56 begins with, um, with several quotations, statements taken from the Quran dealing with this issue. So Quran 42 verse 13. The same religion has he established for you as that which he enjoined on Noah. That which we have sent by inspiration to thee and that which we enjoined on Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, namely that you should remain steadfast in religion and make no divisions therein. So here we have an idea that, that all of the prophets brought the same religion. Quran chapter 23, verses 52 to 3. And verily this brotherhood or community, nation, ummah of yours is a single community, ummatan wahidatan. And I am your Lord and cherisher, therefore fear me and no other. But, and here we get the diversity, People have cut off their affair of unity between them into sects. Each party rejoices in that which is with itself. Quran, chapter 5, verse 48. To each among you we have prescribed a law, shir'atan, from the same root as sharia, and an open way or a code, a minhaj. And Quran 22, verse 67. To every people have we appointed rites and ceremonies which they must follow. So these are some of the verses which pertain to the question. and. Uh, Shah Waliullah continues by listing the things which all the prophets agree on, and these include God's unity, God's incomparability to his creation, the uh, prohibition of heresy about God's names, that God is worthy of magnification, that people should submit to God, that people should draw near to God by observing his rights, that God determines all events before he creates them, that God has angels who do all that they are ordered to do, that God sends down the book upon whom he wills among his servants, that God imposes obedience to him on his people, that the final judgment, resurrection after death, paradise and the hellfire are all real. And uh, they also agree on the different kinds of piety, uh, purity, ritual purity, prayer, almsgiving or charity, fasting and pilgrimage, and drawing near to God through extracts of obedience, such as petitionary prayers, remembering God's names, Dekha, and reciting the books and down from God. And they also agree on um, social conventions, like marriage, the forbidding of fornication, establishing justice among people, forbidding acts of oppression, establishing God's limits. Uh, these are the punishments prescribed for certain crimes on disobedient people, jihad against God's enemies, and striving to spread the commandments and religion of God. And Shah Wali Allah says that these things are uh, the origin, the basis, the original basis of, of religion. So this is kind of the, 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 the unity of religions, but there's also um, an obvious diversity which Shah Allah deals with. So he, he deals with the unity of religion, of deen, and the diversity of divine laws, of sharia, of sharias. He says that there are, he notes that there are differences uh, while there, there's unity in the origin, there's differences in the forms and outward appearances of the divine laws. So, for instance, between the, the law of Moses and Muhammad, there's difference in the direction of prayer to Jerusalem or, or Mecca, in the punishments prescribed for certain crimes, in the times and correct methods laid down for acts of worship. He says that, and, and Shawali Allah, he's interested in investigating the reasons behind all these phenomena. And, and, and the reasons that he gives are, are basically three. Um, he says that they only differed due to causes, so rational reasons and beneficial purposes, masale. First, there are accidental reasons. So for instance, camel's meat and milk were forbidden in Jewish law because Jacob had, had made a vow not to, to, um, to eat or drink them. And that this had then um, been crystallized into a law among amongst the, within the Jewish religion. Second, he says that the divine laws differ because the peoples um, to which the prof different prophets were sent had different temperaments. 
So he says that, citing the Quran, that the temperaments of Noah's people were extremely strong and severe. So they were ordered to fast uninterruptedly in order to combat their animalistic nature. Yet, uh, because the Islamic community's temperaments weren't so severe, they, they were forbidden to do this. He also notes that prophets were sent with different tasks. So um, Muhammad, he said, was sent to establish a religion that could form the basis of an empire or a state. Moses was sent to correct the deviations of a people whom God had chosen. And David and Solomon were sent to renew uh, that, that religion, to ensure the survival uh, of, of, of the empire and religion. And finally, um, this situation of unity and diversity um, leads Shah Walilah uh, to comment on the relationship between Islam and other religions. And here, again, we have the two poles of unity and diversity. So in various points, we have what might be regarded as a kind of proto-Abrahamic religion, concept of a proto-Abrahamic religion, um, which is a concept which, which really is rooted in the, in the Quranic idea that Muhammad was sent with the Millet Ibrahim, with the religion of, Me of Abraham. So he says that Muhammad was sent with the Ishmaelite primordial monotheistic religion, al Milla, al Hanifiyya, al Ismailiyya. And this term Hanifiyya is the same one that we saw in Quran, uh, chapter 30, verse 30. He's, he, he notes that all the heavenly religions, as he calls them, um, meaning the religions of, of the book, unanimously agree on certain issues, such as how to explain the divine attributes. He also notes that at the level of what he calls verification, which is kind of the, the realization attained by the, those with, with the greatest level of mystical insight within the various religions, that at this level, there is unity between um, the, the different religions on various issues. However, he also affirms the superiority of Islam over Judaism and Christianity and the other religions. He uh, adopts the traditional notion that the Jews and Christians had distorted their scriptures or corrupt or that, that their understanding of their scriptures had been corrupted. Hence the need for uh, Muhammad to be sent with the correcting religion uh, of Islam. He also adopts the notion of abrogation, that uh, the religion brought by Muhammad abrogated or annulled the earlier religions. He emphasizes the issue of universal, universality of Islam versus the particularism of other religions. So he says that other prophets have been set to, sent to particular peoples, while Muhammad was sent not only to the Arabs, but to the whole of mankind. And he identifies Islam with what he calls the natural religion, madhab tabi'i. And here we come back to the idea that we saw at the very beginning, that Islam is the religion of fitra, of man's natural disposition. So um, some, some things to think about. Um, so for Ad Naim, uh, who has, has studied various aspects of Shah Wali Allah's thought, he, he says that um, his thinking on religious uh, plur plurality is one of the most direct expositions of religious pluralism in the Islamic tradition. Uh, I perhaps wouldn't go that far, and, and um, those of you who've, who've studied other uh, Islamic thinkers uh, thinking on, on this issue will, will see um, many points of similarity with, with earlier thinkers. But I think what is remarkable is the, the degree to which Shah Walilah is interested in, in this issue of unity and diversity of uh, humanity more generally, but also of, of religious difference. Um, I think that this interest in the unity and diversity of religions is rooted in his, his back to the Quran uh, approach. Uh, the Quran itself is very much interested in how the message which has been given to Muhammad relates to the earlier scriptures and revelations given to the earlier prophets. And, and in a sense here, we see that um, it's, it's in a way natural for uh, Muslim thinkers to think about questions of, of religious diversity and difference. I think this interest in the question of unity and diversity is also connected to uh, Shah Walilah's um, 
deep reading in the Sufi tradition of, of Ibn Arabi, which is also interested in, in this question. And we've also seen how the notion of fitra, which uh, Shawi Allah understands along uh, the same lines as Ibn Taymiyyah, that it contains uh, moral judgments and, and is Islam uh, and um, leads one to Islam. We've seen that this issue is key um, for him to both the unity of humanity, but also to uh, the superiority, ultimate superiority of Islam, which he regards as the religion of Fitra. So that is the end of my presentation. Thanks uh, very much. And I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Thanks, Fitz, for an impressively comprehensive and clear lecture. We do have a few minutes for questions. We have to stop at seven, seven sharp. So if there is anyone who has a question, please go ahead. That's a great question. Lots of um, very good points. Um, I mean, first of all, I think it's worth saying that Shah Allah certainly was, um, was, was, was very much directly influenced by uh, his reading of Ibn Taymiyyah. And I think he's, he's part of this interesting phenomenon which um, Khaled al Ruay has uh, identified in his study of Islamic intellectual history in the 17th century of someone who draws both on Ibn Arabi and on Ibn Taymiyyah, who's, who's Ibn, Taymiyyah, who's Ibn Arabi's um, you know, greatest opponent or most fa famous opponent. Um, and the, the way to, in, in a sense, reconcile those two figures is that both of them um they are they're opposed to the kind of logical reasoning of the of the asherite theologians and 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 seeking to in a sense get back to um scripture um i think your your suggestion that shaboy allah's seeking to apply ibn taymiyyah to the his his, his conception of fitra to the political sphere i think is a good one Shah Allah is certainly very much interested in, uh, in a, a, the conclusive argument from God in practical political questions, how to, um, how to best manage the city. And in this regard, his work is, is, is in a sense in the tradition of Islamic political philosophy of Al-Farabi and others. Um, so, you know, he discusses, for instance, the importance of, of um, keeping taxes low um, or ensuring um, the the punishment of, of of transgressors and and the the ways in which to actually practically um, practically run the city and and I think yes at the root of this is this notion that um, the task of politics is to enable man to recover his um, his natural disposition his divinely inspired rationality as you've called it so yeah I think that's that's a good way of, of seeing it. He does, um, I think, and just um, look at my notes, chapter 74 is on the condition of the people of Jahiliya, which the prophet reformed. And what's interesting um, about this uh, chapter and, and his, his treatment of pre-Islamic uh, polytheism uh, more generally is the way in which he offers a historical explanation. So he's very much um, keen to place the rise of Islam uh, and the life of the prophet within a historical context and to, in a sense, rationalize the need for the, the, the rise of Islam. And I think there, is, there are grounds for, for thinking that he includes um, the, po the polytheists, the, the mushrikun, um, in, in his conception of um, a kind of underlying religious unity, which um, nevertheless obviously doesn't go uh, all the way. Um, so, um, for instance, uh, he says, you know, he acknowledges that the, the Jahili Arabs, they acknowledge the existence of Allah, they acknowledge that Allah is the creator, that he is the one who manages the heavens and the earth, but their mistake was to introduce intermediaries, kind of, um, lesser deities, uh, into their into their worship, into their their religious doctrine, um, he says that they prayed and that they knew um, ritual purity was a part of worship, and and they fasted and they went on pilgrimage and these kind of things. So I think there is there 
very much um are quite you know to me is is quite remarkable um degree of empathy and um and 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 um you know an attempt to to find common ground even with the kind of the 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 most you know jahil of um of of all um which you know i think i think does to me it it, it does suggest that he's he's trying to develop some kind of um doctrine of of religious pl- plurality with that we've run out of time and once again i'd like to thank fitz for a wonderful lecture on an important subject i have many questions which i've written down while he was talking i hope i can have an opportunity to ask those of him and thank you all for coming this is a very very good evening thank you